Um, and just a reminder that tonight's agenda is designed for as much openness for the public to review prior to voting. So we have tonight, and then we have two weeks and then voting. So the whole design of the CAL is not to vote tonight, but just to discuss items at length if need be and publicly before a vote two weeks from now. This is about as open and transparent as we can get for the public, and we hope to stick to this process. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, item 3.02, President's Report. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Baker for uh, his vision and uh, what he talked about just a minute ago earlier this evening from 5 to 9. Uh, I mentioned it back in, uh, I think, both of our meetings in December and uh, that you know we're going to start seeing some a different format and form and uh, what uh, Chris did tonight from five to six that was all uh, Chris's idea he shared that with me back in November of a vision I thought he had and uh, sounded great and uh, real pleased with the turnout this evening and hopefully you know just more positives to come from from that type those types of events uh, along that same lines of a little bit of change uh, like uh, you know we'll, we'll do our best to to get this stuff vetted out at the committee of the whole meeting and we won't have the same questions and answers two weeks from now on the same topics so uh, consent agenda items uh, again there's no action on these tonight uh, but they will show up on the consent agenda in two weeks uh, item 4.01 school calendar dr. long thank you um, this is the proposed calendar for next school year um, this is our seventh edit so far um, but uh, there's some minor changes to it uh, right now we have a hundred and seventy six school days with four act 80 days built in um, the governor has signed into law um, concerning we do not have to have both um, hours and days any longer. Uh, we can do hours or days. So this, this calendar is setting up, up very nicely. Um, right now, I just wanted to make sure that you understood. The elementary um, need 900 um, and minutes, and then the, um, right now they have 994 with this calendar. Middle school um, and the secondary schools all need 990 and they have over a thousand so we're still set up very good with 176 days but the number of minutes or hours that we are getting uh, throughout the school year so, so the changes are we have um, four actually days that we want to use for professional development we have heard from people in the community that um, the wednesday two hour early dismissal days for Professional development is a strain for some people um, because um, so finding babysitting and things like that for students for two hours. So we figured that, you know, why don't we just take the Wednesday as a professional development day, still keep the contracted two hours that they need for planning or grading um, on three of those days and use three of those days for professional development for the morning. Um, and, th and they are September 11th, February 12th, and March 19th. The fourth Thursday or Friday is a very short week. Not much gets done. Um, the Career Center brought out a calendar first to us that had the third as an online professional development day, and the students were off. So then the superintendents, Mr. Bigger and the other superintendents, talked about it and said, well, why don't we just do something on the third as well and have everyone off that week so we're going to give another flex day um, so what that means is that the teachers have a flex day for the day um, the tuesday after um, the, you know the old hunting season monday after thanksgiving uh, right now so we were thinking if we could get another flex day in there on January 3rd, that would give us some more PDT time over uh, the summer that the teachers would need to take a second uh, professional development time over the summer in order to get that um, flex time off. And we also have mandated trainings that we need to get in, um, so that could be done on one of those days as well. So I think we're lining ourselves up some really good things. Um, we do have some things that we want to make sure that we uh, capture when we do these professional development days. 
um, to make sure that our teachers are up on you know activities engagement for students and things like that because we really need to make sure that our achievement is growing um, with that I just want to open up for any questions you might have any questions for dr. long I have a couple questions uh, one the days that are now off for students that are Wednesdays I look at that and I just wonder is there a way to shift any of those to a Monday or a Friday because I think what that would do for families is it would give them a chunk of time that they could actually do something with um, it's just an idea <laughs> it also gives somebody else a chunk of time to take off too Who, who's that um, I don't want to say it out loud but teachers <laughs> oh okay <laughs> uh, food for thought yeah, yeah. And, and there might be really good reasons not to do that but All I right. think uh, you know I have a brother that lives out, out of state and we typically aren't going to go see him you know yeah. and I think there are a lot of people kind of like that you know where, where if you had a three day weekend instead of a two it becomes something that is practical yeah. um, yep. sure we can look at that yeah. E even if you shift just one or two of them. Yeah. Um, right. yeah. And then the other point, I've made this previously, but we have new board, new superintendent. Um, it always strikes me as a bit odd that we have our two longest breaks of the year back to back <laughs> with only mm -hmm. two and a half weeks in between. Mm -hmm. And that Tuesday that I think was originally set aside for folks that hunt, I think the percentage of our students that are hunting on that particular day is close to zero <laughs> even people that are hunting yeah uh i and it's always struck me as a bit odd that we have a spring break that is only one day to me if it's just one day then it's a day it's mlk day right but <laughs> if it's a in my mind if it's a break yeah. it's two or more days <laughs> i think um so I, i've i've wondered could we shift that tuesday and add an additional day to the spring break. I'm not, you know, maybe you have good reason for sticking with it. Yeah. That's totally fine. I can tell you previously, but, it's always usually a, one long weekend um, a month you try to get in there for that reason. I, one of the restrictions I found real quickly here is the Franklin County Career and Tech Center schedule. Yep. And so if we're willing to break from that, and the consequences of that would be the uh, Career Tech students have a very, very different schedule than if we're not going to school when they're in school, they're attending or they don't attend. So I think that's where it slows down the ideas a little bit because we so, do try to follow the Career Tech Center as best we can. It's not perfect, but I think that we have to come up with a, a benchmark that says we'll be no more different than maybe five to seven days, and then maybe we can wrap that in there. Because I think that's about what we are now, probably four or five days different, Mark, would that be? We're down to three right now. Three that are different between us yes. and the Career Tech Center, yeah. That's really nice. Yeah. Maybe that's a discussion for Yeah as you talk to other superintendents around yeah, the county for sure yeah and it's just it's only been what two three years since m most of all the districts <clears throat> got pretty consistent with their mm -hmm. career tech yeah schedule. it's really nice. it, it used to yeah. be really it used to be really scattered i think it, just, it was very scattered very scattered very scattered <laughs> yeah two years just two years ago i think and that's through the the superintendents in yeah. their monthly dialogue and, yeah. and meeting and discussions uh, Dr. Long, I have one question, and if it's sure. on here, I just can't find it right now. Graduation. Yeah. Is it on here? And I'm, am I missing it? It's on the 30th. It's on the 30th. 30th of May. Yeah. So I, I, I mentioned that. Uh, my motive for mention, asking that question is for board members. Um, I think it was two years ago, maybe three years ago, we had four board members show up for graduation. Uh, three, years ago. three years ago thank yeah. you uh, four out of nine members show up for graduation uh, you know that's that's not a good perception personally I tell people and I mean it sincerely uh, the the best reward I get from being on this school board is graduation and we're lucky we get to do it twice we get to do it for career magnet school and we get to do it for the high school 
And I am very fortunate now because of my JOC work, I get to do it four times a year because two times for the nursing program. And, and I just can't get enough of it. I, I love it, it's great. Uh, so I just encourage everyone, put that on your calendar. You know, if you have something planned or conflict, understand. But that's, that's a pretty important, it's a pretty important thing that uh, hopefully we can uh, improve our uh, attendance as a board at graduations. Could we get clarity on two years we've had good attendance? Yeah. yeah. Could we get clarity on the, the two dates? It, it is a, two separate graduations. It's, it's this the year. 29th for the CMS and the 30th for the high school. Yeah. Okay. Thank, just, thank you. Good yep. question. Good. And if I can explain about the Tuesday after uh, the Thanksgiving for hunting season, it's in the contract. So it's a contract issue. All right. Yes. Thanks to Mrs. Clever for reminding me. It's a contract issue and a, and a county issue. Mm -hmm. So, yes. All right. One item I do want to try to deliver on um, when my executive assistant starts at the end of the month, we had a recommendation, I believe, from the active PTO group that meets what's, what they mean under each month versus the really big long list of uh, the key. So we're going to try to make a more friendly one because it's, it's half a visual of the right. calendar and then a whole half of a key at the bottom that's really hard to interpret without like a calculator and, a, and an advanced degree. So we're going to try to make a little more parent friendly one uh, by month if we can, if, that, if that'll make sense. So there'll be this one that ward, but then there'll be a more parent friendly one that does month by month. Here's what school is. Here's what a half day is or here's what an activity day is and all that. So it was that's a, a goal of ours. If it's parent friendly, it's more likely to be student friendly too. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's, and if you remember, it was a very interesting conversation of what these dashes mean and what's the dots yeah. mean and things yeah. like that. So, yes. Any other questions, discussions on school calendar? Uh, that'll be uh, that'll be in. Uh, th there's a comment section yeah. later. Yes, sir. Yep. And since we're not voting tonight, there's no hurry to ask a question. Thank you. Thank you for asking, sir. Okay, this will go forward on the consent agenda uh, in two weeks. Item 4.02, South Hamilton Elementary STEM Club. Dr. Long again. Yes, this is uh, South Hamilton Elementary School. would like to begin their STEM Club now. Um, we did have this approved from the board prior to have each elementary school have a STEM Club. So they're continuing to come in as they find people that want to do it. And this will have one advisor. South Hamilton will have one advisor. Some of them have two, such as Ben Chambers, Hamilton Heights, since they're larger schools. Questions for Dr. Long? Sounds great. I do have a question, not necessarily related to this, but at the STEM program in general. Has that been implemented yet, or when will they be implemented? The ones that we had previously voted on, have they started those? They have started. Yet? And are they having a good um, turnout? Are they getting a lot of applications or? Um, some of the smaller schools have, you know, 12 to 15. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the larger schools are, and they only have one advisor right now. They have a waiting list. That's wonderful. Thank you. Kid, kids love the activities and things like that. That's, that's really, I mean, adults love them. Yeah. I like the incentives too that there are requirements as far as grades and attendance right. and things like that. I think that really incentivizes kids to do well in the classroom and then be rewarded with something that they enjoy doing. So yes. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. No other questions, discussions? Uh, that item will go forward for consent next meeting. 4.03. Okay. Uh, this is um, the Lincoln Learning Network. Uh, this is um, a new contract for our internet. Um, the technology department and the IU came to an agreement with um, different uh, rates. And as far as what is being shared, we get a 20 gig shared circuit now. Um, and, and then this is really amazing. We get 10 gigs of internet instead of two gigs of internet. So when we have, um, 12,000 people hitting the internet all the time, it can bog it down really quick. So, and what's really nice is, and I don't have the exact figure, but 
Dave and I were speaking, it was it's like 300 to 350 dollars a month that was increased, and the technology budget is going to be handling that. So, this is an excellent thing for our district. Um, just as a history thing, I, I mentioned to Dave years ago when Dr. Sponseller was here, I asked for the first internet uh, to come for the, the schools. And um, You're old. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot more gray hair than you do. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's kind of neat to see the progression and how it's moved along. Yeah, I've got a question for you, Dr. Long. Um, so I understand that the high school has its own uh, network services that's outside of this LLN. Is that correct? Mr. Kirkpatrick, do you want to jump in here and help me? Sure. <coughs> oh. yeah. yeah, so yeah, they do. Uh, they have a two gig shared internet circuit for just the Chromebook. It's not shared, I'm sorry, it's a two gig dedicated just for their Chromebook traffic. The rest of the traffic hops on the rest of the district network. Yeah, I was just curious to know why they were not shown in the list of all the other schools. So they have a 10 gig dedicated, we own the circuit between the high school and here. Mm -hmm. So it's it's nothing that we pay for monthly. That was a one-time build cost. Okay. A couple of years ago. So all right, thank you. Know, they have their own 10 gig pipe just to here. Got it. All right, thank you. I knew he would explain it a lot better than I did. <laughs> Dr. Long used his phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Long or Mr. Kirkpatrick? Okay, move this one forward then as well. 4.04, .04, Secretary to Assistant Superintendent job description and increase one hour per day. Dr. Long. Yes. Um, my assistant is going to be retiring um, very quickly, uh, beginning of March. Um, so uh, with the different duties that are, have been added in um, since she re announced her retirement, she's at 35 hours a week, um, and we would need this person to go to 40 um, to just handle all the extra things. Um, the the new job description has a few things added to it um, homeschool liaison is still in the job description but i will tell you that um, when i joined with wendy um, five or six years ago we had right around 300 students going to homeschool we now have 551 and she handles all that she handles the affidavits she handles all those different things that are concerning homeschool the um, evaluations at the end the objectives and um, I also have to go out with her and knock on doors if they're not doing what they need to do. So um, she is a viable resource for our district in this aspect. Um, I am also the Title IX coordinator for student um, affairs as far as discrimination and things like that. And she serves as um, my confidential secretary as far as the Title IX items that have to do. Um, I don't know if you know any about Title IX, but Title IX is an awful lot of paperwork an awful lot of paperwork. So, um, and I am not a paperwork kind of guy, and I really need someone with paperwork skills. Um, and then also the new teacher induction program, um, these are the three big ones. The new teacher induction program, um, my secretary has been covering that for years, even before Wendy, it was um, Nancy Summers. Um, it's changing now to be a two-year program for teachers instead of uh, the one-year. Um, so that is going to be an added um, paperwork and just keeping up with all the different trainings and things like that that the teacher, new teachers have to do in order to fulfill this requirement. So with this, um, these are the added items and this is also the reason why I'm asking for an additional hour per day to make it 40 hours a week. And the total cost for that um, 40 hour week then is $5,816. Questions for Dr. Long? <clears throat> okay, this item will move forward also then. Thank you. 4.05 Hoffman Homes contract and statement of work. 
um, are we that one's pretty self-explanatory on the yeah. description. Yes. Okay. Any questions? And unlike the past two years, I can vote on this one, so it'll stay on the consent agenda. If there's no questions. Okay. 4.06, uh, Sage Technology Solutions. Mr. Carter. Okay, so this, uh, this item is actually a contract um, that just has taken several months to try and figure out and, and uh, dwindle down where we needed to be with Sage Technology. The original project uh, with Sage Technologies was almost a million dollar project, and what this is is speakers, horns, um, PA systems inside and outs outside of schools. Uh, it's called a Telecenter U, which is the brains of of the PA systems in the, in the schools. So that gets us to every classroom. That's the phone systems. That's being able to do an all call in the building if we have an emergency. That's to be able to all call outside or inside or both. Uh, previous to this project, we all of our schools were kind of all over the place with uh, what kind of safety measures they had in, in that realm. So we wanted to get everybody on the same page. This also allows schools to communicate with each other. Uh, via phone system and via the extension systems. When we originally put the project together, um, we thought we had everything into that project. Uh, and then as it turns out, when he would come into the school, they would take a deeper dive into uh, what was there, what was not working, what should be working, and some problems they ran into, at which point in time they come up with some additional issues for our schools. Originally, as it started, it was this is what you need and this is what we also recommend. That original um, contract that came out in October, it would have been somewhere between 63 and $93,000. Uh, we went back and forth with the company uh, and they agreed to do the entire project recommended and what we actually need for a mere $50,000. And I say mere um, in the totality of the project. Um, in order to do this correctly, what we did was we had a lot of teachers, principals, cafeteria workers, in some of these areas in our schools that said they can't hear announcements. When we do our drills, drills are announced. Um, if we have an emergency, hopefully that can be announced and we use the phone systems. So what we found was there were a lot of areas that were insufficient that are included in this contract and that should make the entire project whole. So that's why we went this way and tried to amend it. Um, I take responsibility for the project not being fulfilled in the original $956,000, but there were some things that, um, anybody that knows me, I'm not a technology expert, um, but you know, I had many conversations with Tammy and, and I do take a hit for that. I apologize for that, but there were a lot of things that were unforeseen that needed to be included in this. And I really believe that every school to have that robust system for safety and security would need these things added to that original project. Any questions? Questions for Chief Carter? I appreciate your diligence on it, Chief Carter, to make sure everything's the same across every school. I appreciate that so much, sir. And it, it took a lot of years to, to get that consistency across the schools, but what we really do is we listen to the principals, we listen to students, and, and we listen to um, the teachers and workers in the schools, and they're the ones that really come up with these comprehensive lists that we put together to make sure that they do feel safe in the schools. Right, and there's nothing more than parents want to know that their children are safe every day and everything's done to protect them. We might get some calls on our announcements because our amplifiers will let the neighbors hear it at this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we'll be okay with that. So, Mrs. Stauffer, I noticed this is Esser's funding. Are we coming to the end soon of Esser's funding? Is it running dry? Mm -hmm. We are coming to the end, thank goodness. Uh, I think Bobby would probably be more grateful for that than I am, but yes, we are coming to okay. the end through uh, what Gary needs to expend yet, and of course we are closing out the project okay. here in at Stevens. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, item 4.06, we'll move forward on consent agenda. 4.02, CASD, CAEA, collective bargaining agreement, one year extension. Uh, Mr. Bigger, you mentioned this earlier also. Yeah, I'll just reiterate, I want to thank them for meeting with us um, and the school board and, and to um, 
just go over a one-year extension to buy some time, especially for me coming in, understanding the working conditions, understanding the contract, and being able to make adjustments that we both agree and need to through a formalized process. It would have been very rushed starting in December um, to try to get something done by June, and I think it would have failed. So I do appreciate everyone's, um, uh, this is a good time to kick the can down the road for one year. So I do want to thank everybody for that. Okay. Comments? I think the Education Association needs to be commended for agreeing to this uh, or maybe even suggesting it because I, I think that it's uh, commendable of them to offer this. Any others? Okay, item 4.07 will move forward on our consent agenda uh, next meeting. 4.08, contracted bus drivers, van drivers, and aides. Uh, Mrs. Stauffer, Mrs. Stein. Yes, um, this is a standard item that the board will see uh, frequently when we have new drivers or aides or subs um, be hired by our contractors, we bring these forward. So currently we have uh, Freeze Contracting, Ryan Myers, and Rolling Hills that are recommending uh, several individuals to be added to our uh, driver list for the 23-24 school year. Questions for Mrs. Stauffer? discussions or comments because I'm new just for my clarification I'm going to assume but I figured I would ask that they go through some kind of uh, not background check but some type of check like that within those agencies to make sure that the people are being vetted that they're having yes. come on board yes okay. they, they have all the clearances and background checks that a district employee would have okay thank you mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, 4.08 I'll move forward on the consent agenda. Uh, that'll, uh, for now, that's all of our consent agenda items for next meeting. Um, next is uh, finance and facilities category. Item 6.01, facility presentations. Uh, Mr. Varner, please. Good evening. Uh, tonight, I just want to bring to you a quick presentation about the Buildings and Grounds Department. Um, it's really designed to be an overview of who we are, what we do, projects we recently completed, uh, and then an intro into future projects. Um, so I'm gonna throw a lot at you over the next few minutes, um, but I will do my best to keep it brief. Um, so the first slide we have here uh, is our mission statement. Uh, our mission is to plan for and provide the highest quality environment that is clean, safe, and conducive to learning for the students and staff and guests of Chambersburg Area School District. Uh, this is something that we recently developed. Uh, this is important to me because uh, as a department, it defines our purpose and serves as a guide for our employees to work towards common goals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this next slide is some information about the district, uh, about staff and facilities. Uh, on the left, we have our staff breakdown. Um, I, I'm not going to walk through uh, every one of these positions, uh, but currently we have 92 budgeted positions. Um, we are fully staffed with the exception of our custodial department. Uh, we have nine, uh, we have currently nine vacancies, uh, eight in the secondary and one in the elementary. Uh, we also have 11 substitute custodians uh, and one student worker uh, that are not on this list. Um, some quick facility information there on the right. Uh, we have 17 schools, 13 elementary schools, four secondary schools. They range in age from oldest uh, being 1950 uh, to the newest uh, being constructed in 2014. Uh, we have four support buildings. Our 21 buildings span 250 square miles and account for just under 1.7 million square foot of building space. Uh, Chambersburg Area School District maintains roughly 271 acres, uh, and on average, our maintenance trade staff complete about 3,060 corrective action work orders per year. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this slide is some of the services that BNG provides to the district. Uh, as you can see, we cover a wide range of tasks from HVAC, electrical, plumbing, to snow removal, mail delivery, and construction design and management. Uh, we do have uh, a limited number of contracts for various equipment services uh, and to help with snow removal. Next slide, please. The next two slides are gonna be a sample of capital projects completed over the last two years. Uh, the primary focus for this first year uh, was life safety and security equipment. Uh, mixed in was a small roof project and replacement of toilet partitions at various locations. Um, next slide, please. Uh, last year's projects included a roof restoration at the Reserve Center. Uh, this is the facility that houses B&G Food Service and the CASD Police Department. Um, at Cassius, uh, we, we restored a 22-year-old section of the building that was not renovated uh, during the 22 set, 20, 2007 renovation. Excuse me. Um, we replaced windows and exterior doors at CAMS North. Uh, and we are currently in the process of renovating the auxiliary locker room at Cassius uh, that was last updated in 1989. Um, this was the result of uh, a Title IX investigation and a recommendation by the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to capital improvement projects, uh, Chambersburg Area School District received one-time ESSER funds allocated by the state of Pennsylvania to address facility needs. Uh, the district was able to use a portion of these funds to replace outdated HVAC systems in several buildings uh, to improve air quality and to create a healthier environment. Uh, through these projects, uh, we were able to free up several million dollars of improvement projects from our 10-year capital plan. Um, also on this slide, I've just included uh, a statement from the Department of Education uh, on the eligible use of ESSER funding. Next slide, please. This is the list of the ESSERS projects completed over the last two years uh, and the scope of work that was performed at each location. Um, Chambersburg Area School District completed just over $24 million worth of building projects. Um, I will note that Cam South uh, was initially identified as the greatest need, uh, but during preliminary studies, it was determined that there was not sufficient ESSER funds uh, to complete the project. Um, so after uh, much discussion, uh, the focus led to the elementaries and the district office. Um, the goal for CASD administration was to affect as many locations as possible. Um, seven total locations were identified. Um, the six listed above uh, in, Grandview, in Grandview. Uh, Grandview being the only school that did not get accomplished. Um, from direction of the, the board, uh, we decided to stop um, and determine whether it was feasible to do an ESSERS project at that time. Um, with inflation um, and you know, significant increase in construction costs, um, there was not significant funds then to, to do a project at Grandview. Next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot of our 10-year capital plan. Um, and more specific, uh, the next two years of cr critical facility needs. Um, this is a living document. I also use the term organic. Um, it's constantly changing based on the needs of the district and the life cycles of the equipment and the facilities. Next slide, please. As you can see um, on the bottom right of this slide, uh, the two-year funding needs for critical projects are in excess of $44 million. Uh, $42 million of that uh, is for a comprehensive renovation to CAM South, a over 50-year-old facility with many operational needs. Next slide, please. The next few slides are just some background information and statistics for CAM South. Um, it's approximately 174,000 square foot. Uh, it was constructed in 1972, again, over 50 year old. Uh, there was a limited HVAC project in 2001 that replaced uh, selective unit events. And also in 2010, the gym and auditorium units were replaced uh, due to failures of those units. 
Um, overall, the exterior of the building is solid with masonry construction. Uh, new windows, soffit, and roof were installed in 2019-2020. Next slide, please. Um, th this is, these are just um, some pictures of the uh, interior of Cam South, um, some classroom areas. Uh, the top right uh, is a slide of uh, the mechanical space, just showing you some of the, the antiquated mechanical equipment. Uh, bottom right is a shop area that currently does not have any air conditioning or, or um, dust collection. Uh, that would be addressed in this project. Next slide, please. Um, again, just uh, more slides here showing a classroom unit ventilator. Um, that's the media center, uh, corridors, and uh, the auditorium there. Um, next slide, please. So the proposed scope of work for CAM South um, would be a full interior renovation, including plumbing, electrical, and HVAC systems, technology upgrades, addition of sprinklers, and minor uh, site work to include replacement of stormwater catch basins. Next slide, please. So Crabtree Rohrball completed a very preliminary cost analysis. Um, the estimated total construction costs uh, exceed $36 million um, with the addition of the soft costs. Uh, the project grows to about $42,261,000. Um, this analysis includes uh, small programming or some programming changes to address educational needs, uh, but it does not ad ad address um, additions to the building. Um, the cost of the remodel came in at about two, $210 per square foot. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, new construction costs for similar facilities right now are coming around the ballpark of $350 to $450 per square foot, or $61 to $78 million. Um, add in soft costs, and uh, it's likely uh, well over a million, $80 million project. Um, next slide, please. So this is a proposed schedule for CAM South. The original schedule was developed uh, late last fall, uh, but with the new incoming superintendent and four new scored school board members, um, it was decided to delay discussions. Um, this schedule was really built around a goal of a summer of 2025 um, begin date for construction. Um, I will say that, you know, having delayed discussions, we, we are really at a point now where there's very little flexibility in this schedule if we want to uh, begin uh, a, a summer of 2025 construction, which would estimate uh, completion date uh, into the spring of 2027. Um, really, if we were going to accommodate that, we would need direction from the board at the general meeting on February 27th to proceed with design. Um, so any, any delays would really delay it to a summer of 2026 uh, construction date. So um, again, this schedule is for planning purposes. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, rush a decision or create any pressure, um, but I do want to impress upon the folks in the room tonight that there are many operational needs at Cam South um, that could turn into costly repairs uh, or even affect the uh, facility usage at Cam South. So um, next slide, please. So yeah. I'll open it up to any questions or discussion. Let, let me jump in here first, Pat. So uh, coming in midstream to the project, um, I wanted to spend some time talking about educational programming. And uh, Matt and I will meet on Friday, and I think um, we have to take a look at our educational programming across the district and make sure we're delivering our services for education along with facilities. And so that I'm not necessarily putting a stop to the need at Camp South, but I think we have to look at the broader picture of the whole district and really dive into that feasibility study. So, you know, I am gonna work with um, Crabtree Robo to do a demographic study to make sure we're targeting the right schools that need space or don't need space in addition to what you're seeing here at Camp South. So I just like to approach facilities more of a master plan um, than looking at the latest need. And that's not to criticize the work so far. I'm not, and it's great work. You needed to hear and see Cam South current status but at the same time, I think we have a lot of educational programming needs we have. So um, most likely we'll slow down a little bit, but have a thorough analysis come hopefully 
you know, April, May, June, uh, where we look at that master plan. And you even spoke about that at our last meeting. So again, great work to this point. I don't want you to feel the pressure, but I do want to pump the brakes a little bit until we get that demographic study done and then a, a much deeper feasibility study. I think the last one was 2022. And the guidance of that feasibility study was specifically around ESSERS, and it was not educational programming. So I like to flip it to educational programming and then see what we can rally around and hopefully include Camp South as a solution to the greater educational programming. Does that make sense to the board um, and to you, Matt, as well? And I know he, we haven't talked too much about it yet. But I think you should still ask questions about the, the middle school itself. Um, but in the greater picture, we'll just slow down a little bit. And if I could just hitchhike on Mr. Bigger's comments a little bit. If you recall back in the fall, I think it was October, we had a joint uh, Buildings and Grounds and Finance Committee meeting, and uh, we were discussing this building. And it was a fabulous meeting. Um, there were a lot of ideas, thoughts, questions, discussions in the meeting. And um, to, to steal Mr. Bigger's term, the takeaway from that meeting, everyone agreed to pump the brakes, that we wanted to make sure we were doing the right scope of a project, not just a project. And uh, it's gonna take some time. I mentioned it in, in my uh, opening comments in, in December, when I mentioned that this is gonna be a heavy lift. And I'm not talking just financially. There are a lot of things to evaluate, discuss, options, uh, possibilities, exciting stuff, but it's gonna be a heavy lift for the board yeah. and, and the committees and, and, and everyone, the staff, uh, to what we wanna do, we wanna get it right. We don't wanna do it right away. Uh, we wanna make sure we get it right. Uh, it's going to happen, it needs to happen. Uh, you know, as Mr. Bigger said, Matt has laid out, you know, there's, there's a lot of deficits there. And if you look at the capital plan, you know, that's why we're doing the fire alarms right now. And uh, even we can do the fire alarms now, and it's not like we're gonna have to redo them when we do the bigger project. The scope of the work for the fire alarm, um, there, there were some issues here just back in the, you know, the first half of the year with some fire alarm issues over there. We're gonna get that done. We're not gonna wait to do that. But it's not going to, it's, we're not going to spend $200,000 on fire alarms now and then tear them out and redo them. It's, it's planned in with the project and we can keep that. So, uh, you know, like I say, it was probably one of the best committee meetings uh, that, that I had been, uh, been able to participate in back in October in, in my eight years that just the, all the ideas that came out and we have to throw them together. Mr. Bigger mentioned the, uh, you know, the uh, the study from from the architects, and you know, on educational programming, you know, we've we've had studies before, but they've been what I this is an ed term. prepared the site and and, and uh, did the construction. So, so based upon what I heard, Mr. Bigger and Mr. Norcross said. This timeline that you, pre this preliminary schedule is now no longer accurate. C correct. Okay. Uh, that would be though, if you moved it forward later on, it would be a similar time frame over that. It's type just of being delayed. So yeah. it's not something that we would be seeing where it says school board review authorization. Right. Everything is being yeah. delayed for the time being. Yeah. I just want to make sure, cause it seemed there was a little, I wanted to make sure I understood that. You're, you're spot on it. Uh, okay. You know, I didn't want to stop the presentation, the process they did and be a jerk. It was, let's, let's finish the presentation as they thought. However, um, you know, I'm gonna lay out like four different steps. It'll be like a demographic study first, and that'll happen in February, and maybe March, April will be our educational programs, which will drive our facilities. So what, what we've been missing is what educational programs do we need to serve our kids? And, and no discredit to him, most facility directors do warm, safe, and dry. Keep the buildings warm, keep it safe, and keep it dry. That's, that's what they care about. Um, it's not his job to do the educational program, that's, that's our job. So that's the heavy lift for us to give you a good educational program. Then we do a feasibility study with architects around options for our educational programming. And that's where it'll get fun and challenging and here are some options moving forward around our educational programming. And I hope the, the middle school's included in that. 
So I, I just envision a much, a little bit larger of a project than just the, magnet, uh, the middle school, if that makes sense. And so may I ask you a question? Given that we are now delaying everything, are you anticipating whenever we do come back around that with the current economy and inflation and such that the numbers that you've given to us will rise yeah. probably, I'd say, 10% at least? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. um, you know, any, any delay on projects, I would anticipate uh, some additional cost in construction. So, and I just want to say, I, I do completely, uh, I laid out this timeline because I, I want you guys to, I want to impress upon you guys right. the need for Cam South because mm -hmm. I, I can't reiterate enough that there are needs there. Yeah. Um, but I do agree uh, with Chris that we need to take a more holistic approach mm -hmm. um, and that we need to get all the constituents involved mm -hmm. and really put that master plan moving forward that really guides us in, in our construction projects. So, so another question, and I, you'll learn I'm very full of questions. I like to have as much information as possible. <clears throat> so I apologize on the upfront end to anyone that doesn't appreciate that. But so going forward then, um, as that goes, let's say there is an issue with the plumbing or, I mean, it has to be addressed immediately. Then that supersedes whatever other thing we may be looking at doing, yeah. like say the whole HVAC just goes to crap or whatever the case might be. His, so does his, his budget then goes with yeah. that, yes. So, yeah. And so that comes directly from whatever it is that you're doing. So anything that would have been projected out for across the board gets funded straight to that? That's correct. That okay. would really affect our operational budget at the B&G department mm -hmm. because we would have to throw resources in an emergency yeah. um, to correct the situation, yeah. not to interrupt uh, learning, so yeah. And since you seem to have uh, pretty good working knowledge of that is there anything that you think is like for me like i we own a machine shop and so i know when machines are getting close to whenever they need to be done or whatever are you uh concerned in any particular area at cam south that you think is more problematic yes yeah, so i mean it's 1972 construction so it's well over 50 year 50 years old the the infrastructure of that building is all original so um i don't mean to get geeky or techy on you here um i'm a geeky guy but uh I don't know if you've ever heard of Federal Pacific um, main distribution panels, electric panels. Wow. Um, Google them, but we have original 1972 Federal Pacific um, main distribution panels in that building. So um, it's just there are some antiquated systems in there. Um, our kitchen, we struggle. We really struggle to keep the drains open in the kitchen. Uh, we've had to repipe some of the lines. Some of the kitchen equipment is less than reliable. Um, so we've really put um, some Band-Aids on over the last couple of years just to maintain that facility. So. And last question, and, and then I will move on. I saw on this little, I'm assuming this is for us, the Crabtree Roar Ball that you put in here. It says uh, the relocation of the gas line. And then it said uh, TBD. Is that something you think would be necessary? Is that a safety thing? Is that just a constructional thing? I yeah. was just curious. I think the, that was just something that we put in there um, because, you know, uh, currently, uh, the system is the, the, the hot water boilers or, or gas. Um, depending on what kind of system we go with or changes, there could be a, an additional gas line or a larger gas line or increased volume or you know something to operate the new system. So we just figured in there, and I do want to go back. I didn't really say this. We believe that that is a conservative uh, number. So we, we truly believe that the number could come in less than 42 million, but we really wanted to be conservative on that number for the board, just so that you could see whether it was something that you wanted to enter entertain for design. So that's why the gas line is in there. Um, there's potential that we wouldn't need any gas work, um, but there's always that potential. So we wanted to figure that into the cost estimates. All right. Thank you very much, and thanks for the presentation. I really appreciate the detail. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, it concerns me that the most urgent top priority back in 2019 mm. <laughs> is now being, the, we're kicking the can again sure. five years later. Um, I, I, I guess we're at, like I see a lot of value in doing a feasibility study, demographic study. That, mm. that makes sense to think big picture. I'm fully supportive of that. I wonder, should we move forward on some of this? simultaneously while you're doing that work. Like, because as I understand it, all of this work needs to happen anyways. Our costs are only gonna go up. Why not at least get the ball rolling on a portion of it? I don't, I'm not quite sure that I understand the benefit yeah. in not doing them simultaneously. 
that's a board decision. I mean, you can argue that. I think there's economies of scale um, when you get into more than just the middle school project that you gain from looking at it at a larger scale. But you could do a push pull and get started on that while you're looking at another one. It's an option. Um, I would hate to see you get started and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. um, the educational programming says something different and now you can't change. Can you give an it, example? Gonna, well, let me, maybe I'm going to. give an example of what that might be? Let me, maybe let me put, I was going to refer maybe back to Matt on this. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Matt, but with, with this scope, mechanical, electrical, plumbing renovations, which is mm -hmm. the bulk of it, it's hard to separate those, that type of a scope Mm -hmm. And Matt, if I'm totally off base, you won't offend me if say if you say Mr. Norcross, you're dead wrong, okay? But I I would suspect it's very hard to to replace HVAC duct work and components now, or and it'd actually be more expensive, and then do the electrical and plumbing side of that later. Now, if it was roof and Plumbing, yeah, you could do roof now and plumbing later, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe you can. I build roads and bridges, not buildings, so I'm gonna yeah. refer to Matt. You're correct, Mr. Norcross. Um, you know, if you're trying to piecemeal a project together, there's typically not value in that. Um, the value comes with scale. the large scale facility project. Um, and I do want to be specific. The project that we're presenting here is a much larger scope than the Essers projects that we performed the last two summers. Um, this is interior finishes, doors. This is basically a gut level renovation with some programming uh, included. I met with uh, Melissa Cashdollar, the principal over there. We talked about some programming needs. There's two libraries in that facility. We talked about building in one of the libraries as additional classroom space and you know some different concepts maybe for the shop areas. Um, so. Um, that is included in this particular project. What is not included is if we would decide we wanted to do a, a cafeteria addition or if we wanted to mm -hmm. do another addition of a classroom space. Um, that would not be included in this $42 million. Well, and I think that's where that demographic study is so important to at least get a better current evaluation of what the potential uh, number of students and needs are going to be along with potential changes in educational presentation so a library could turn into a classroom are there yeah. are there other examples that you have yeah let me board? let me give Just you one if, if I, I hesitate to do this because i don't want the public to run with it Right. As, a, as a this is what we're doing so it's not but just let me float something to give you an example of why i think you have to slow down uh i, I mentioned in the forum that the high school is too big how do we make it smaller Right. What if we decide to pull ninth grade out of the high school and put them yeah. into the two middle schools um, and then build some intermediate schools? So now we need ninth grade programming. We n might need more career and technical education shops, tech eds. And yeah. now you're talking a different program. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one example. But please don't run with it down to social media and say I that's heard what Chris doing. Bigger said that yes. the ninth. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the scope of the change I'm looking at or we're looking at um, to solve some of the problems that we're seeing. Maybe just, hey, high school's too big you know, culture, climate, things we're talking about. Yeah. So that's, that's one example. So I lied. I have another question. I'm sure when you say a statement like that. Ben yeah. said something, and then it made me think of something else. So, Matt, I know you're back at your seat now. Of this list here where it says the scope, are there things on here you could piece together, like the plumbing and electrical and leave some of the other things off if we were to move forward simultaneously? Or is this like a, it's got to be all of them together? That way we can knock it out of the park. Well, again, uh, you know, you're talking about can it be done? Yes. Is there value in doing that? Not typically, because okay. in order to do HVAC, you got to open up walls, you got to remove ceilings. So if you're going to remove the ceilings in a building, it makes sense to, at that time, install the new lighting mm -hmm. and you know replace everything above the ceiling. And, and if you know, and you know, you're obviously going to tear up the finishes as you're doing a c construction project of that magnitude. So you know, it makes sense then to address the finishes. So I mean, can it be done? Um, it would be more like an Essers project that we did this summer. Um, you know, kind of Essers on steroids, maybe. Yeah. Um, so but I just don't see a lot of 
uh, value, value it. of, so of for, doing the piece. For all intents and purposes, it's all or nothing would probably be the most bang for our buck. That would most make the most, that would be the most fiscally responsible okay. thing to do. All right. Matt, Matt, just right on that concept alone, it seems to me the design time frame is really long for uh, HVAC. We're really not over designing the building. So you're going from February till September. That's a long design period. From a because uh, it's, yeah. it's it's yeah. existing work that's being redone. We're not doing a lot of new walls or a whole bunch of them. Yeah. So I see some wiggle so room. So there, there is some wiggle room on that schedule as far as design period, um, as far as bid dates and everything else. Yeah. Um, the really the, the real issue is that we, we want to give time to execute contracts and allow yeah. contractors to secure materials before we decide right. to go to construction. There so go. there's some those front end dates um, could fluctuate a bit, um, but we do want to have a lengthy design period. Um, you know, uh, where I come from um, in higher education, we typically did a two-year design period. It's very lengthy, but uh, it, was, it was quite a uh, fantastic process. Um, we've been on warp speed here the last couple of years with the Essers projects, and so when you're talking four or five million dollar project, uh, I'm okay with that, but when you start getting in the realm of 42 million dollars, um, I want to make sure that if we're doing design, we're, we're doing it right, and we're hitting all the needs. Agreed. So that's why it was a lengthier design period. Appreciate that. And just another comment, just on, on context, that maybe this message doesn't get uh, perceived wrong. It isn't like we have not done anything at South. We knew this project was coming up. We did the roof in 1920, 2019, 2020. We did windows in... You know, so so this has been this has been a process. You know, it hasn't been like ah well. You know, we're gonna wait, we're gonna wait, we're gonna wait. Yeah, we the, did, the we can, did the, the can was the, kicked with good reason. We we, we did the roof. Yeah. We did the windows, and we mm -hmm. knew all along this was this was coming. You, you know, you, and and ma the the sequence makes perfect sense, right? You don't want to put new electrical in the building if you got water running through the roof. So let's get the roof right. You don't want right. to put great new efficient, you know. HVAC system in there if the windows are leaking like a sieve. So the windows are good now, right? It's, it's, a, it's a process. The only other caveat I would add to doing uh, bits and pieces of the project along with a district feasibility study, um, I did a, a, a district uh, facility master plan uh, way back in 2008, showing my age, uh, at Shippensburg <laughs> University. And uh, that was quite a lengthy process and it took a lot of buy-in by everybody. Um, and a lot of time commitment. Mm -hmm. um, so in the B&G, how we're structured, um, in order to do design and to execute projects, project management, we really have myself and Scott Moyer, my assist assistant, sitting next to me. So if we would begin a construction project to that magnitude, along with uh, a feasibility study or a master plan, Yep. Um, we would really stress our staff, including myself. Yeah. Uh, we'd have uh, CM staff department. on that. We'd have, yeah. yeah, we'd have some support for you for that. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, when you, when you talk about having done anything, it's all relative. Remember the school I came from, we had no air conditioning in, in any building except one when I left. And the middle school is still there, and it's 1932. Um, and we are finally consolidating that. So it is all perspective. You are very fortunate. You do have air conditioning in all your buildings. You know, so I, I'm just like, wow, thank you. <laughs> um, but we can be better on the educational programming with the facilities. So it is a, it is a nice marriage, um, and I'm looking forward to the discussions, Matt. And, and I'm sorry they had to come out, you know, right in this meeting. You know, again, um, don't, no discredit to anybody's process and where they are at, at time and place right now. Yeah. Which, as you see on the agenda, this is listed as a presentation, i.e., information item. You know, there's no actions, yeah. and this is just part of the getting it out, getting the dialogue started gathering information and there's a lot more to come there's a lot of work for all of us to do uh, as board as staff uh, everyone and then just think the last comment with that is this is the reason the committee of the whole is doing the work and not just a committee yeah because of the amount of buy-in that's needed and so all of us seeing and hearing and being part of this is what we need yep thanks again Matt I really appreciate that yeah that's good Um, great discussion, great questions. Uh, don't want to stop it. So, any more? I mean, I got lots of them. <laughs> okay, stay tuned because there will be more. Yeah. 
Uh, item 6.02, budget and finance pre presentation. Mrs. Stauffer and Mrs. Nope. Good evening. Um, it's a hard act to follow, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> I'll try to do. I'll try to do justice. So I, I promised Chris I'd be short, and for those of you who know me, uh, that can be a little bit difficult for me. But I will keep it brief tonight. This is just an introduction uh, to school finance and to budget, which Danette and I feel we do all year long. We talk about the budget. Basically, we're either getting out of it, getting into it, or managing it. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight um, about a few topics. Um, where are revenues and expenditures and what they're composed of? We'll talk a little bit about that. I'll give you an overview of our history in terms of what we projected and what our actuals actually were over the last several years. We're gonna take a look at where we landed, 22, 23, and I have to emphasize this is unaudited because if I don't, Danette will probably throw her pen at me. Um, we are still in the audit process. Uh, some people might say, well, your fiscal year ended June 30th. Why are you not finished with your audit? Uh, we work on an accrual basis of accounting, so that requires us to account for things through the end of September and accrue them back into the, the prior fiscal year. The audit will be out sometime either in February, March, and, and that's always presented by our auditors. We're also gonna talk about fund balances because there's, um, I think, some unclarity about what the fund balance is and what its purpose is and how we have to account for some things. So I wanna share that with the board so that there's an understanding of it. And then we'll talk about the 24-25 uh, budget timeline. Next slide, Dave. Oh wow, I thought I could read it from here, but I don't have to look over here, sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens when you get a little older. So let's talk about revenue sources. Um, unlike a business, our revenue sources are limited from where they come from. Okay, we have our local sources, our state sources, federal sources, and other financing sources. So if you look at the big blue part of the pie, you can see that 57% of our revenue comes from local sources. So that's earned income tax, that's, um, LST, that's real estate tax, that's our transfer taxes, our interims, the bulk of it is coming from the local entities around us. State sources are about 28% of our budget, our revenue budget. Um, the outlier this year in the 23-24 budget is our federal sources. As you can see that purple piece is about 8%. Normally that's around four or 5% of our total revenue that we get from the federal government. And then other financing sources includes um, our budgetary reserve and some interfund transfers. I would like to point out that the budget, current budget and revenues includes just under $11 million of one-time federal money. To your point, Mr. Bigger, that will be done hopefully by the end of uh, 2024. And then it also, just to, to point out, especially for the, the newer board members, um, we made a decision the last two years not to include the governor's recommended budget because as you know, or maybe you don't know, the budget is never approved before we approve our budget. Um, and they've been quite sizable amounts of increases that we have historically not seen. So this budget does not include the $3.5 million that was ultimately approved in July by Governor uh, Shapiro in, this, in the House, in the Senate. Okay, next slide, Dave. So when you look at um, our expenditure, if you move it, thank you, up a little bit more, Dave, just a little bit more. Yeah, there you go. Um, we account for our expenditures in two different formats. One is by major object, and the other is by major function. And if you're looking at this pie, a couple of things to point out is our salary and benefits represent 60% of our budget. So 60% of our budget is things that we have to do. It's through contractual agreements with our employee groups and other things of that nature. Our purchases are contracts that can include transportation contracts, uh, contracts for speech therapy, uh, psychologists, just a lot of different types of contracts are involved in, in that purple part of the pie. The piece that is what I would consider to be discretionary is the supply category, and you can see that's 3% of our budget, just around $6 million. Within that supply category, though, we also account for gasoline and diesel and some energy costs, so there are things that are not necessarily discretionary, even within that piece. If you look at other objects and other finances uses, this is where our debt service sit, both principal and interest, and also the budgetary reserve and some interfund transfers. Oh, I thought, you had, I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> okay, next slide, Dave. 
Looking at our expenditures by um, function, you can see that instruction is 57% of our budget, or just a little over $110 million. Um, this is directly related to the instruction of our students. When you look at support services, that's 24% of our budget. People often think that's administration. While administration is in that piece of the pie, we also include our psychologists, our counselors, social worker, health services, transportation, and uh, technology. Am I forgetting anything, Danette? Uh, libraries in there as well. So a lot of these support services, while they're not direct instruction to the students, they are supportive of the students. Um, moving along then, uh, the other piece that I wanted to, to pick out is just the capital improvement. You see that red piece of the pie. Um, that sits under what we call our 4,000 function. Normally that's not in our budget. That's something that we do through our cap reserve and our bonds and things of that nature, but because we are including ESSER money into the 23-24 budget, that's what that sliver is. And then of course debt service and other includes our debt service, principal and interest, and also some interfund transfers. Next slide, Dave. Moving into a look at the history, you can see, can you move it up just a tad bit? Yeah, thank you, okay. You can see the expenditures are the dark blue line, revenue is the gray line. With the exception of the 17-18 year, um, our revenue has exceeded our expenditures, which is, is a good thing. It helps us build our um, fund balances for those rainy days. The um, anomalies to point out would be in the 2020 school year and the 2021, <coughs> these were the COVID years. Um, we found things to not be what they predicted them to be in terms of the revenue. Uh, they were talking about our inco income was gonna fall off by 30%, it didn't. It actually was higher than it was prior to COVID. Uh, we also found that we had expenditures that we did not incur just due to the way that we were instructing students at that time. But overall, we've, we've done a fairly good job of making sure that our expenditures are not exceeding our revenue. Next slide, Dave. Okay. And this graph just basically shows you um, how we've budgeted and how we've performed. And again, the outlying um, numbers are the ones in the 21 school year and the 2022 school year. Uh, we predicted 20% um, reduction in inter income tax. They said 30, we did 20. Again, that didn't happen. We also have seen uh, in the last few years, interest co income has exceeded the budget. But overall, we've done a fairly good job of making, meeting our revenue budget. Next slide, Dave. Um, and this is a historical look at um, how we have budgeted expenditures and where those expenditures have come in at. And again, if you look at that one year, the 2022 year, you can see that our actual expenditures exceeded the budget by 7%. The bulk of that is related to ESSER projects that we did not include in the budget, but ultimately spent. Okay, next slide, Dave. Okay, that's, yep, that's good. Okay, so where we're gonna land. Um, our revenue for 22-23, uh, <coughs> excuse me, was just a little over 184 million with expenditures at around 174 million. So our variance was just under $10 million that we added to the fund balance. Going down through, you can see that at the year end, and our fund balance is usually a snapshot, it's one day, it's when we calculate it. This is always done on June 30th. We had just a little over three million non-spendable in the fund balance, and I'll talk about what that is on the next slide. We had a little over a half a million that was restricted, a little over eight million that was committed, that has a purpose that has to be used for. <clears throat> and then, excuse me, we had a little over 30 million sitting in our assigned balance for a total of just under $42 million. Moving into this fiscal year, for the board's members who were here and approved the budget last year, you'll recall that we recommended two interfund transfers. One is 3.5 million to go into our health care, and another 3.5 to go to our capital reserve. So you can see those transfers were done. That's a total of $7 million, brought our assigned fund balance down to 23 million. You can go to the next slide, Dave. So let's talk about the fund balance and why we need it. Um, I don't remember, it was several boards ago, a board member asked me, you know, what is this fund balance? Like, what does it mean? And I thought, how can I explain this? Because it's a term that people really don't, you know, it's not part of normal language. So if you look to this slide, you can see where the fund balance is really equal to your savings account. If you want to put it on a personal level, it's your savings account. If you look at our revenue, that's your paycheck. And expenditures are the bills that you pay. So 
Normally, we hope that our paycheck is going to meet all our needs with our bills, but sometimes it doesn't. You know, we might have a water heater go bad, or you might be struggling with your dishwasher, which I am right now. I'm thinking I'm going to have to buy a new dishwasher. Oh, no. um, so when you have those unexplained, unplanned expenditures, if you don't have enough income, you ultimately have to dip into your savings account. And that's pretty much what it is for a school district, is to have that savings account. But this information that I'm going to talk about now is really important for not only the board to understand, but the general public, because within those fund balances, we have designations, and it allows us to determine how we can utilize the money. So if you think about the assigned fund balance, what we have in there are for things that are unplanned or unknown. We have our budgetary reserve in there. We carry a $5 million budgetary reserve in our budget on both sides of the budget so that if things come up, and you will see this, I, I can guarantee you there will be someone coming up here and saying, I need X amount to come from the budget reserve because something has occurred. Such things as special ed increases, or we have to add a new um, route. Um, you know, if we have a special needs child that moves into the district and they need to be transported on a van by themselves, you're talking forty to $50,000 just for that one route. Charter schools may increase due to enrollment or changes in enrollment from regular ed students to special needs students. We also have had at times, as we did last year, um, which was a bad year for healthcare, our claims exceeded our premiums, which meant basically the cost of how we were insuring people, what they were costing us was costing more than what the premiums were putting into the fund. So this is money that we can use when those unknowns come up. When you look at the restricted, um, these are things that might come in in a, a grant, and it is identified for a specific purpose. It just doesn't get spent in the fiscal year, so we sit it into a restricted fund balance. Also could be special ed settlements. I believe we approved one or two of those maybe in December. Um, whenever we approve those settlements, say it's 20000 or it's $30,000, we sit that money into a restricted fund balance so that when it's, it's utilized, it's there for it to be used. And also tax appeal credits. Inventory and prepaids are what we put into our non-spendables. The easiest way to, to, to identify this, like inventory, for example, um, we use a lot of paper in this district, a lot, of, a lot of copying, a lot of paper, so we order all of our paper off of the LIU bid. We bring it into the warehouse. It sits as in, that expense sits in an inventory account until it is pushed out to the buildings and then we expense it out. Future property tax relief, this is a really important one. Um, in the committed fund balance, we have just a little over $8 million, and this is a requirement under Act 1. Um, we are an Act 1 school district, also affectionately known as one of the crazy eights, uh, which basically, um, I think it was in 2006 or seven, we voted as a community to, to push real estate tax burden to earned income tax burden. So whenever we budget uh, earned income tax, if we collect more than we budget, I'm gonna use round numbers, say we budget 20, million and we collect 21 million, we have to take um, about 57% of that 1 million because the, the split is one, it's 1.2% 1 and it splits 0.5 and 0.7. <coughs> so we have to take about 57% of that and put it into a committed fund balance for future taxpayer relief. That $8 million that is sitting in our committed fund balance can only be used for future taxpayer relief. <coughs> we did that this current budget, we put an extra million in there for the Homestead Farmstead exclusion. So while it looks like we have $8 million there, we do, but it's going to go back out to the taxpayers, if that makes sense. And then one that is not a part of the general fund, but is one that we obviously, just following up on uh, Matt's presentation, we need to talk about is the capital reserve. Um, when I started in this position in 2018, we had a cap reserve of $900,000. And um, uh, those of you who know what my husband does, he's a facilities director, so we would chit chat about this, and I was losing sleep over it. <laughs> Basically, all of these facilities, and you have a cap reserve of 900,000. So we've been working, I think, pretty diligently to try to build that up. Um, we have, over the last few budgets, been able to transfer um, bond refinancing savings in there, so that's helped, and we're getting there, but it's, it still needs to, to grow. Another thing, just to put in the fund balance into perspective and why it's needed, um, I think the longest that it went while I've been in school business was uh, a budget didn't, from the state didn't get passed until early November. So if something like that happens, we do not receive any state subsidies. 
So to give you an idea of what our expenses are per month, you can see from September through November, we expended um, just under $17.5 million. You need to have money available in order to pay your bills, basically. Okay, next slide, Dave. So the budget timeline. I'm not gonna go through all of these dates on here. Some of these are just important to us as we're working through the Act One budget process. As you recall, we did do an opt-out resolution on November 14th. Basically what that stated was the board agreed that um, the district would live within the index, which the, for this current budget year coming up, the Act One adjusted index for us is 7%. That is literally the highest I've ever seen it in the 17 years I've been here, but that's, that's pretty high. So we voted to say, we're gonna stay within that 7%. We're not gonna go above it. We're not gonna ask for exceptions. We're not gonna seek to go out for a vote or referendum. So from the board's perspective, on February 13th, which is another committee of the whole, um, Danette and I will have prepared the first budget forecast. On April 9th, then we'll have prepared the first, or the, excuse me, the second forecast, which basically during that time frame, we're just tweaking numbers. We're looking at the assessment base, we're getting information from the state, we're just tweaking what we can to kind of get that actualized for you. And then on May 7th, we will present a proposed final budget and the board would vote on um, June 4th to adopt the final budget. And that's our budgetary time frame. Next slide, Dave. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Mrs. Stauffer. Any questions? Is there a cap on the fund balance? There is a cap on the unassigned fund balance. It can be 8% of your budget. We don't classify any money unassigned because we always know that we're going to have probably special ed increases, possibly transportation increases. So there is a cap. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Stafford, as you mentioned about last year, the, the three and a half million. Uh, For the cap reserve. Transferred to the health mm -hmm. insurance fund. I mean, that, I don't know if that's an annual event, but it happens pretty darn often if I think back through. Do you just... How yeah. often? I mean, every other year we end up, maybe every third year? What we have seen over the, like, the last five to six years, uh, the health care account used to grow. You know, it mm. was growing to the point where at one point we pulled money out of it, if you remember. Right. Um, it has been going like this. Mm -hmm. And so when we hit this past year, we had a lot of, I want to say, quite a few high claims, over a million dollars. And so it takes quite a long time. We have stop loss insurance. Last year it was 250, this year it's 275. That's still a lot of money you have to pay out. But I'd say probably the last two, two to three years we've done a budgetary transfer to healthcare. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think related to that, uh, we all saw that from post COVID uh, mm -hmm. responses of people going back to the doctor or more regular routines. Um, I think all of us saw that increase in healthcare costs post COVID. Yeah. We have one year where we had, I think three or four preemie babies. It, it, it's just, it, it goes, it ebbs and flows. And so, uh, when you have those situations that fund then starts to dwindle down. Um, so no other questions. Thank you, Mrs. Stauffer. Thank you, Mrs. Note. Okay, item 8.01 is uh, really for, for information uh, about uh, state police doing our assessment, uh, Chief Carter. Wasn't overly prepared for this one, but I found out about it today. So yeah. you can thank um, me for you, that. You, I'm sorry. Yeah. You no. can keep it brief. No, I can I, I can I read what's I can read what's on here, and no, you can just say there's yes. There's really not much to it. So in 2014, 2015, uh, every school in the district uh, had risk vulnerability assessments done by the domestic security section of the Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, in 2018, when Act 44 came in, 2019, it is now a mandated requirement uh, by legislation that every school uh, has that done. We just had six done in 2021, uh, and I'm hoping, normally it's, they do one a year per entity or per school district. Um, I'm hoping to have our other 13 schools done by the end of this year. 
uh, does help to be a 25 year veteran and know a couple of people in the state police that I think will. And what that does is it has the outside entity to the state police come in. They give us a snapshot of what's good and what we need to correct or change or recommendations uh, to make our schools safer and better. So, you know, we're looking to have them come back in and make sure we do uh, all of our schools and all of our buildings uh, by the end of the year. Thanks. Any questions? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Chief Carter. Okay, item 9.01 is, uh, is privilege of the floor. Um, this is a reminder the public comment is not a forum for personal attacks, antagonistic behavior, or harassment. Please be advised that you are accountable for any legal ramifications and liability that results from statements that misrepresent the truth, defame individuals, or disclose personal information that is not a public concern. Um, the list uh, for public comments, and sir, don't worry. If you're not on the list, we're, you're still going to have your opportunity, so don't worry. But I'll do the list first, and then you'll be second. So, uh, Mr. John Jordan. Okay, and I know you always have this announcement about this isn't an attack on anybody or whatever, but anyway, one of the things that bothers me, I have a couple suggestions for the board. It looks like we're on a new leaf, meaning we're going to do better. The meeting we had tonight was the start of that. We have a new board president. Uh, we have new board members. One of the things that always bothers me, and I know it bothers a lot of the other people, a lot of times board members will be up there talking about when I was this or that, or they didn't have kindergarten, if we don't, uh, if we don't, uh, if the professionals don't do what we want, we're gonna get rid of them and things like that. That's not really appropriate. And at the reorg meeting, we had a lot of conversation about your family, Ed, so I'll bring you up as an example. And that, I feel, was generated to my wife. And that was from emails that you had passed back that was inappropriate. And I really believe that, you know, that she sent you an apology for that because she was wrong. But after the meeting was over, as the new board president, you came out into the audience, gathered up members of the um, audience that came over and confronted my wife. So you probably owe her apology for that. Now, the other thing that I think would help for a long way with the board is that when we have votes that are controversial, like we've had Stevens Elementary School, the budget with a $2 million uh, deficit, uh, the handling of Betts, which is over with now. We have a new guy here that looks like he's going to do a great job. All of those issues, the board members voted a certain way. And the problem is that you vote that way, and then the meeting is over, and a lot of the people in the audience are angry because you didn't vote the way that they would have liked you to vote. But the transparency issue is huge that the board isn't transparent. So what happens is the people go out in a parking lot and say, well, that playground equipment, if it would have been for Hamilton Heights and not Stevens, the board would have voted for that $35,000. So that makes the board look really bad. So one of the things when I was a public official years ago, when we had these controversial votes, either the board president or members of the board would explain why they voted the way they did. Like, they could have said, well, we voted about the Stevens Elementary to give away $35,000 of free money, and this is why we did it. Nobody ever said that, and there was 30 people out in that parking lot fuming about that. And it made the board look terrible. And the same with other issues, the Betts issue and the other issues, all of those issues, there was never an explanation, no transparency. Just the board votes and walks away, and the people go out in the district really pissed off. 
to be put it politely. And they say the board is doing a terrible job and they're not taking care of our whole educational system and it makes the board look bad and everybody's unhappy. So maybe the board and should apologize to the people for the way they voted. And that's asking a lot, I guess, but maybe that's over with and we're gonna have a new leaf forward and do things the right way, but when we do a vote, say, we voted this way because of this issue. Not just vote no and then walk away. And I guess if I have another second to talk that I just heard that Wellspan raised their minimum wage to $17 an hour for everybody. So I think that it, the school board would be well to raise the minimum wage, because I know we have people in the school district, support staff that are maybe making 10 or 11, $12 an hour, and we have trouble keeping them. If we were paying them more like all the other places that those people are leaving and going to, then we would keep those people. And if you keep the people, the whole system runs much better. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Sir, go ahead. Since, uh, just do me a favor, since you didn't sign in, just give your name, please, yeah. and then. Uh, Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Killian. I have a daughter at Fayetteville, and I'm the vice president of the PTA over there. Uh, just a couple of things that I uh, wanted to ask about and talk about with you guys. Um, so uh, Dr. Long, looking at the school calendar, and uh, Mr. Raber said something about this as well. You were saying that the half days on Wednesdays are a issue for babysitting, yet you are then going to take a full day on Wednesday, which would potentially still be an issue for babysitting because it is in the middle of the week. So I think that is potentially why it's not that it's a half day, it's that it's a Wednesday, as opposed to a Friday or a Monday. And I understand the, the reasoning of long weekends, teachers want to take long weekends. You know, I was a long-term sub for many years in different districts, and you know, we took a long weekend, we wanted to do that, so I get it. Um, but in the same respect, you, you owe it to the parents of the district to, to take that their, their complaints and say, okay, well, maybe we should not do Wednesday days off or half days. Um, so if you could look at that a little bit further and the board could discuss it a little more, I think it would be beneficial because I, I can see the, the issue there. Um, I'm lucky that I have a, a work from home job so I don't have this problem, but I know that there are many, many, many others that do. Um, and again, Dr. Long, sorry to put you on the spot, um, but with your new uh, assistant position and asking for the hourly increase, which I think you have all the right to do, um, specifically speaking of the homeschool position, is there the opportunity there to, to make that a, a separate position for somebody and therefore maybe decreasing the hours on your, your assistant and the workload on your assistant and have just an individual person do all of the homeschooling because you're increasing the students and I believe that that is not going to change. It will just keep increasing. Um, so you may come at to the point where you're going to have to do this in the future anyway. Um, is that something that you guys should potentially look at um, going forward? And um, while I have the microphone, um, at the meeting from five to six, Carl did give a shout out to our PTA. I did reach out to him and thank you for coming to our meeting last night. Um, I would encourage all of the board members, if you have not been reached out to from the schools that you are representing, to, put, to go to the schools or to reach out to the principal or the PTA president, if you have their email, and, and go to their next PTA meeting and, and talk to them about the issues, see what they're saying, what are they talking about, what are they doing at the school, how can you as a board member support them, how can you address their issues in, you know, in your position, right? Like, 
you, you were elected to this position from by those people, so you owe it to them to go and talk to them, I think, at least you know, once, twice, three times a year, however you want to do that. But I think that would be very beneficial. Um, so I hope to see you again at some point. Carl, obviously not, not every meeting, I understand. Um, you have a lot of work. So, um, but thank you guys. I appreciate um, the opportunity to come up here and, and talk to you. And I apologize for not get doing it the, uh, the legal way. <laughs> um, but thank you and uh, have a good night. All is well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the fund balance was mentioned tonight, and I need to understand just one thing in the fund balance, in the one fund balance. There's six and six and a half million dollars in the fund balance for earned income tax. And that's the money that I'm having the most issue with. And it's going nowhere. And it was presented as a savings to me. And I left my paperwork home on that because I didn't realize there was going to be public comment. I'm going to bring that paperwork with me at the next meeting, and I'm going to read it. And it's going to take less than three minutes to read. That six million should be in the general fund. And that would wipe out the deficit. And I'll explain to you at the next meeting, because I didn't realize there was going to be a public comment tonight about uh, on the, I guess it was added at the last minute. I looked at the um, agenda, I guess, yes, yesterday when it came out. I didn't look at it today. So I am going to read something. And I'm also going to ask Mr. Norcross a question because he already knows. And I'll start asking that question, and hopefully I'll get an answer. Because my husband's right. When you make a critical vote and you vote no, you should really tell the public why. A yes vote means you're for the children. A no vote means you aren't. And that's basically the bottom line. Really, and I've never heard in the two years that I've come here when a board member votes no, why they voted no. And out of respect for the children, the children, then the teachers, and then the administrators, you should explain that. And I didn't realize my husband was going to say that tonight. So I thank my husband for bringing that up. So the paperwork will come with me. It's less than three minutes long, and it talks about numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, item 10, new business for discussion. And just a reminder to board members, uh, we have our final session with uh, Dr. Sherry S Smith scheduled for uh, January 16th, 6 to 8 p.m. in this building. Uh, you know, look to uh, wrap up our district goals uh, and then turn that over to Mr. Bigger and his uh, capable team to move forth with, with programming and, and the specifics of that. And we'll do some, start into some board goals and also, as promised, uh, discuss the committees a little bit and, and get those finalized. Well, we won't finalize them at the workshop, we'll actually finalize them at, our, at a meeting, but a discussion of, of what they're gonna look like and uh, how. So with that, uh, our meeting's adjourned.